Don't be afraid of violence. It's good for you. I mean, there's three things that make our existence, right? Art, f***ing, and killing. So, art, f kill. John Battaglia was a terrible husband and father who stooped to unbelievably evil depths for revenge. And this video explains how. After her husband turned abusive, Mary Jane made the decision to divorce John for her own safety. It was at that moment that she learned of his terrible history, which he had hidden from her for more than a decade. Over the following months, she did her best to keep him at arm's length, but with two shared daughters, it felt almost impossible to get rid of him. Sadly, he would do anything to make her life a misery even if it meant resorting to the worst crime possible. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and as always, I've got another darkly fascinating story for you. This one's probably one of the most saddest and sadistic cases that I've covered. And this guy, well, he really did take revenge to a whole new level. And by the way, I've got some very exciting projects in the pipeline coming very, very soon, so please do make sure you're subscribed. For more information, until then, check out my Patreon or Instagram. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of John Battaglia. Howdy folks, the year is 2001, and we're traveling to one of America's busiest states, Texas. More specifically, our story occurs in the sprawling city of Dallas, home of the Cowboys, frozen margaritas, and apparently financial banking. It is here that, once upon a time, we could have found the somewhat broken and estranged Battaglia family. Consisting of John Battaglia, Mary Jane Pearl, and her two daughters, Faith and Liberty Battaglia. We'll get back to the likes of Mr. Battaglia soon, as there is quite a lot to unpack there. But circling back to the mother and her children, Mary was a loving parent who adored her two daughters. Being nine years old at the time this video takes place, Mary Faith, who was the eldest of the two children, was born in 1992. She was known to be a real tomboy, hated the colour pink, and refused to play with dolls. And if she was ever given a dress to wear, well, that would never go down well, apparently. In stark contrast, Liberty Battaglia, who was born in 1995, was only six years old. She grew up as a quintessential girly daughter, reveling in dressing up, playing with Barbies and dolls, and performing dance for her mother. Despite their contrasting preferences, both sisters found no trouble in getting along, though. They were almost inseparable were polite and kind to those around them, and both attended John Bradfield Elementary in Highland Park. Looking at the pair side by side in their school portraits, it is easy to see their personalities and differences shining through. While Liberty sits hand on hip in a floral dress, Faith takes a more casual stance in her red short sleeve baggy button-up shirt. The two girls were quite lucky. Their mother, named Mary Jane Pearl, was a loving and devoted parent, and she was also a successful antiques dealer. The happy family of three lived in the affluent suburb of Highland Park found in Dallas. It's a shame that I can't leave the story here. And that's because their father, named John Battaglia, was still in the picture. When it came to his personality, behavior, integrity, pretty much everything else, he was an entirely different story. Although John and Mary did initially love each other, this would not last forever. And so, after marrying in 1991 and having two kids, they would divorce in 1999. So, the next big question is, who was John? Who was this man? And why did Mary divorce him? Unfortunately, answering those three questions will leave you rather outraged and disgusted. Born on the 2nd of August 1955, John, with the last name reminiscent of Pasta, hinted at his Italian heritage. John's roots can be traced back to a military base in Alabama, where Julia and John Battaglia Sr. welcomed him into a rather nomadic existence. From Alabama to Texas, then to Washington DC, Oregon, and New Jersey, their constant relocations characterized the life of a military family often forced around the country. As a military child, John experienced a strict and harsh upbringing. His father, John Battaglia Sr., enforced discipline throughout rather physical punishment, becoming rather aggressive and wielding belts if his children failed to comply with his orders. The household rule was clear here. 
do as I say and don't ask questions, with the consequence of a beating if they did not listen to their parents. Now, living in such an unkind manner has been extensively studied, with research indicating that this form of parenting will inflict significant psychological trauma on a child. Despite the challenging environment, John reserved his affection for his mother, Julia, who was the peacekeeper of the home. Unfortunately though, Julia's mental struggles led her to confinement in a mental institution in 1972, when John Jr. was only 17 years old. And battling severe depression, she eventually turned to alcohol as a coping mechanism. In the meantime, John embarked on a dynamic young life, touring with bands, serving in the military, trying his hand at modelling, and earning an accounting degree. A degree which will eventually become the profession he settled into. Now, before his marriage with Mary, he was actually in a previous marriage with Michelle Getty, with this marriage also resulting in a daughter named Christy. And although this relationship would end in 1987, John continued to care for his daughter. Following the end of his first marriage, John would eventually find Mary Jane Pearl, with their whirlwind romance resulting in marriage on April the 6th, 1991. At the time, John seemed to be charming, polite, and exceedingly generous to those around him. Unfortunately though, as you will soon find out, this was all just a facade. It was over the next eight years that the couple welcomed two daughters into the world, Mary Faith in 1992 and her sister Liberty in 1995. From an external perspective, the growing family seemed to be quite happy in their life in Highland Park. However, behind closed doors, challenges arose in John and Mary's relationship, because post-wedding, John underwent a very noticeable transformation. The man became irritable, prone to shouting, and occasionally raised his fist, though never striking initially. But over these years, John's behaviour escalated to belittling Mary, manipulating her actions, and constantly undermining her. But despite these difficulties, Mary attempted to keep the family together, especially after the birth of Liberty. The verbal abuse in their relationship was never constant. Instead, John adopted an erratic hot and cold approach. One moment, he would be deeply enamoured with his wife, and the next, he would erupt into fits of shouting. Now, it's probably worth mentioning here that John had bipolar disorder. His demeanour and his behaviour would never be consistent with his wife, and this forced her into a continuous state of confusion and discomfort. Leaning into this, John was also a man of many masks, and so, despite the verbal abuse, he was able to keep it hidden from those around him. He would never display his violent behaviour in front of their two daughters, who were, from everyone's perspective, his pride and joy. To onlookers, including Mary herself, John was devoted to his daughters, often showering them with both support and affection. Many believed he would never harm his daughters, as he never once raised his voice, spanked them, physically hurt them, or even scolded them. And although Mary felt rather unsafe herself, she believed that her daughters were secure in the care of their father. So, we have a classic wolf in sheep's clothing situation going on here. What could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately, this was merely the beginning. Over the years they spent together, Mary would eventually defend herself and bite back at John. But John, he would double down and punish her even harder. Christmas of 1999 was supposed to be like any other. The family spent the festive period together, accompanied by John's first daughter, Christy. However, that is when things took a dark and violent turn. It was on Christmas Eve that John attacked Mary for the very first time, and tragically, it was in front of all of their children. The girls begged their father to stop as he punched and pushed her to the floor, leaving Mary covered in cuts and bruises. And obviously, that was it for her. The very next day, she reported him to the police and filed for divorce. With all daughters witnessing the assault, John didn't have much room to deny his actions. And so, with that in mind, he pleaded guilty to one count of misdemeanor level assault and was given two years of probation. This meant that John was no longer permitted to live with Mary, which kind of makes sense because she had already expressed that she did not feel safe around him. And of course, her daughters would stay with her. Now, despite John proving that he he was dangerous, he was still allowed to see his daughters. In fact, he would still see them weekly, babysitting them at his place, picking them up from school, and even visiting them at their mother's house without any supervision. Mary still believed that John would never harm his children, 
and that, furthermore, he loved them more than life itself. I mean, as I've already said, he had never shown any form of abuse towards his daughters. But little did Mary know that John was capable of much worse than she could imagine and neither did she know of his terrible history. A history that he had kept hidden from her throughout their entire time together. And although Mary was aware of his previous marriage, she wasn't quite aware of why it ended. As you may expect, the reasoning behind the divorce was not sound at all, because, as it turns out, Michelle had divorced him after months of physical abuse. And as for the harassment, well, that had become so bad that she had to file a request for him to be arrested on multiple occasions, as she feared for her and her daughter's safety. John was not discreet about his abusive behaviour either. On one occasion, he assaulted Michelle right outside the front gates of his daughter's school. On another, he visibly broke her nose. John's violence only got worse after these altercations, eventually leading Michelle to file for divorce. And John, he was furious about the news. In fact, upon finding out, he attacked her so severely that she had to be admitted to hospital. And all of this happened at a public bus stop. The authorities were swift to involve themselves after this, but sadly, it was already too little too late. Because although John wouldn't hide his cowardly attack on Michelle, he had still caused her more grievous harm after she alerted the authorities. Following his assault, John pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge and began his first two-year probation. He then discarded his wife and daughter, leaving the two of them to pick their lives up as he looked for a new woman to terrorize. And so, John's and Michelle's marriage ended in 1987, and then, shortly after, along came Mary Jane Pearl. Although it was evident that John had a long history of violence, it was only after filing a report herself that Mary became aware. And of course, after this discovery, it only further solidified her resolve in the divorce. Despite his probation demanding that John refrain from messaging Mary, he would ignore these instructions and continue to harass her instead. He further told her that if she were to revoke his probation, he would stop the harassment and so, eventually, she complied. Sadly, this promise did not last long. It was in Easter of 2001 that Mary gifted their daughter a $50 gift card. But later that night, John left Mary a terrible message on the answering machine. Mary Jean, next time you give my daughter $50, why don't you tell her how you screwed her out of her college fund, you effing pig? How does that feel, pig? Simultaneously, John began to verbally bash Mary Jane in front of his colleagues. He would often tell them how vile she supposedly was, and revealed that she was banning him from seeing his daughters. Of course, he made himself out to be an innocent and devoted father, and claimed that he just wanted a normal life with his family. However, his whimsical facade would not last forever. Over the next two years, his resentment towards Mary simmered, steadily approaching a new boiling point. And all of this venomous hate was sure to erupt in one of the most horrific and unpredictable ways possible. May 2001. As John moved through the first half of the year, he began to violate his probation more and more frequently. This was marked by frequent incidents such as public drunkenness, marijuana use, curfew breaches, and relentlessly harassing Mary. With so many violations, the police had instructed him to turn himself in to police custody, but instead of doing the right thing, he decided to see his daughters instead, hiding all of this information from Mary in the process. Meeting Faith and Liberty from a neutral zone parking lot, John took them home for dinner while Mary watched the three of them drive away. With him living at Adam Hatt's loft apartments located in Dallas, it wasn't a long drive away. Using her time alone to relax, she then made her way to a friend's home for dinner and a catch-up. Mary had done this many times before, and today was supposed to be no different. But tragically, she would be gravely wrong. It was roughly two hours into her evening that she received an unexpected phone call. Picking up the phone, her youngest daughter was on the other end of the line, but something appeared to be off. She seemed extremely upset. All she could manage to say to her mother through tears were, why do you want daddy to go to jail? Mary's stomach dropped. It immediately became clear that her girls were not safe in the presence of their father. All she could do now was tell her six-year-old daughter to run and find safety. But what happened next 
was unbelievable. Following her plea to run, Mary heard several gunshots ring out over the phone. First it was two, then a short succession of five, followed by silence. That was until John picked up the phone before saying, Merry fucking Christmas. That being a cold reference to the day that she reported him to the police. That phone call must have been the most unbelievable moment in Pearl's life. She had long known that John was a bad apple, but for him to murder his own daughters, that was just far beyond her darkest imagination. She ended the call and dialed 911 immediately. She had to act fast. If there was any chance of her daughter surviving, they would need medical treatment as soon as possible. To make the situation more complicated, officers knew that John may be there and armed and dangerous, and so officers had to be very careful. But after being given the all clear, with medical personnel rushing to save Faith and Liberty, they were sadly pronounced dead at the scene. Detectives would find 16 firearms located throughout the entire property. As it turns out, he was not collecting them merely for self-defense. With John nowhere to be found after police stormed the property, it appeared as if he had cowardly fled the scene. But he would only do that after leaving a chilling voice message on the answer machine. The message read, Good night, my little babies. I hope you're resting in a different place. I love you. I wish that you had nothing to do with your mother. She was evil, vicious, stupid. You will be free of her. I love you very dearly. You were brave girls, very brave. Liberty, you were oh so brave. I love you so much. Bye." This voice message would only further break Mary's heart. John had murdered their daughters for the sole purpose of revenge for reporting him to officers. And with this dangerous man out amongst the public, nobody knew if anyone else was at risk. An active search was executed, with the authorities and volunteers alike looking for him within the hour. And thankfully, it would not take long for John to be tracked down. The man was found at a local tattoo parlour, getting commemorative tattoos of a rose on his left bicep. That being to symbolise the two daughters he had just mercilessly slaughtered. What kind of sick person does that? Following his discovery, John was apprehended outside of the tattoo parlour but only after getting into a fist fight with officers outside. Quite frankly, he is lucky that he wasn't shot on sight. With him now in custody, all eyes were on Mary and her daughters. The community was devastated to learn of the dreadful news, and many couldn't fathom their father's deplorable actions. This was a moment when the community banded together around Mary, who was left with one of the most harrowing ordeals a mother could face. Their funeral would be held soon after, with Faith and Liberty laid to rest alongside their grandfather in Hillcrest Cemetery. In the meantime, John was incarcerated while he waited for his trial to begin. This would take almost one year to commence, beginning in April 2002. And as expected, John Battaglia was charged with the most severe crime possible, that being two counts of capital murder. You know, John's actions were so vile that he now actually holds Coffeehouse Crime's fastest record on deliberation timing, that being 19 minutes. It took the jury only 19 minutes to determine his fate for the rest of his life. That is how confident and angry they were at the man. Being found guilty with two counts of capital murder, John now faced life in prison without the possibility of parole, or, with it being the state of Texas, the death penalty. John's defense argued that since he had bipolar disorder, he had diminished responsibility for his actions and therefore should not face the death penalty. Rightfully so, this motion was denied. In fact, just eight days after being found guilty, John had the luxury of having his tattoo needles upgraded to the spicy needle, because he was sentenced to death via lethal injection. Following his final sentencing, Mary Jane Pearl would say, You are one of the most heinous murderers of modern times. I would like to say the next time you see me is when they put that needle in your arm, but I'm not going to waste my time by being there. And it wasn't only his recently divorced ex-wife who would endorse his execution either. Michelle Getty and his only surviving daughter, Christy, both believed he was a twisted man beyond rehabilitation. Christy eventually reached out to her father, 
though she never forgave or justified his actions. She understood that justice was due, and so she never fought his final sentence. Following this, John was held at the Polunsky Unit near Livingston in Texas, which is hailed as one of the hardest prisons to serve time on death row. Being held here includes 22 hours of solitary confinement per day, and even so-called recreational time is spent alone in a cage. Over the next 16 years on death row, John would do several several interviews in which he talked about his reasoning behind murdering his daughters. He often joked and talked extremely matter-of-fact about his crimes, showing little remorse in the process. Now on death row and with no way out, he knew that he was a dead man walking with nothing to lose. In his newfound comfort, he commented on all previous crimes, including his assault against his first wife, Michelle. Attack Michelle? Uh, I wouldn't really call it an attack. Went up to her when she was walking down the sidewalk, and I said, you're, uh, you're going to have to learn this lesson. And I just held her by the shoulder, and I popped her in the head twice. And, you know, she moved her head the wrong way, and I snapped her nose. The first blow that he hit me w was in my eye. And it was like I felt my eye hit the back of my head and come forward. And, but then he hit my nose, which broke my nose. The bone punched through right here. And she fell down, and I just walked away. She said I struck her about 20 times, but she was unconscious before she hit the ground. And then my jaw, which dislocated my jaw, um, and then I had a, like a big bruise here, and as I fell, he just kept hitting, and once I hit the ground, then he just started kicking. Well, the fact that she got me put in prison, <laughs> she, she knows that, that uh, the bullshit she pulled, the only way to keep from sending her front teeth flying out her asshole is to have me behind this glass because she's a bitch, and she deserved to have the shit knocked out of her, but you know, what the hell. And when you think about that incident, how does it, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel like I should have killed her. She's such a pain in the ass. John also attended multiple interviews where he claimed that he was an excellent father, calling himself a fun and loving father to his three children. But considering how much of an abusive, nasty piece of work he was to his previous wives, I couldn't disagree more. I think I was a good father to liberty and faith. Yes, I, I mean, you know, I tried to be. Oh gosh. Oh, my fondest memory of my daughters. Uh, well, I have another daughter. She's 30 now, Christy. When, uh, when we used to all get together and go somewhere, it was a kind of a little bit of a three ring circus, if you can imagine. Three highly energetic, fun, little girls just having a great time. Filed for divorce, I knew she was going to betray me, and that betrayal would probably lead to all of our deaths, so I went and got their names. John failed to show any remorse throughout all interviews, and instead of facing his shortfalls and apologizing, he casually chatted as if he were the main character sitting at a bar. His indifference to others is very apparent here. He acted as if it were his way or the highway, and he felt vindicated in teaching his partners a lesson whenever they stepped out of line. Knowing he was on death row and with no power and no way out, John also made it appear as if this was the way he wanted to die, as if it were better than any other option available and it was on his terms. Would I say I'm ready to be executed? I mean, I don't want to be, because especially now that I'm speaking to my daughter, I like that. But, um, I mean, as far as like mentally prepared, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be that big deal. I mean, it's better than getting snuck up by somebody and shot in the back or killed in a car crash and, you know, chopped up the hamburger meat or dying in some stupid son of a bitch's war in some place. So, I mean, of all the possibilities, it's not that bad. It's very clean and they're very nice to you, considering. I mean, you could die of cancer and have some big giant growth on the side of your head or your brain being tumored. But, I mean, just you go to sleep, it's kind of nice. It's almost Snow White-ish. 
John Battaglia's execution date was initially scheduled for March the 30th, 2016. But this was delayed several times after he argued that he was not eligible for such a sentence due to his mental state. These appeals were overturned multiple times, with psychologists contending that John was deliberately feigning ignorance. After several unsuccessful attempts to overturn this, John's execution date was slated for February the 1st, 2018, a staggering 15 years after he murdered his two young daughters. Now, despite expressing that he was ready to die many years prior, John tried to push for an appeal a mere few hours before he was sentenced to death. Well, too little too late, mate. On February the 1st, 2018, at 9.14pm, John Battaglia was executed by lethal injection. Surprisingly, despite prior statements indicating otherwise, Mary Jane was present at his execution. In the days leading up to his execution, John persisted in claiming wrongful conviction, accusing his ex-wives, defense attorneys, prosecutors, the jury, and even the Ku Klux Klan of conspiring against him. Those who had known and once loved John, including his ex-wives and even his surviving daughter, concurred that the death penalty was the fitting outcome here. During his execution, the room was split in two for witnessing, one half to be occupied by the victim's family and friends, and the other for John's family and friends. In a strong visual statement to John, nobody occupied the latter half. After seeing Mary in the crowd, John would say, well hi Mary Jane before turning to the warden. He further said, I'll see y'all later. Bye. Go ahead, please. 22 minutes later, he was dead. John Battaglia's death spelt the end of pain and misery to many. Near and far, everyone agreed that this was the right outcome for his terrible actions. As a direct result of John Battaglia's case, the state of Texas changed its laws around child visitation rights after divorce, taking any sort of domestic violence into account. This change was way overdue, if I'm honest. I mean, it's quite obvious to recognize that if you're violent towards a previous spouse, you are capable of doing it again. Faith and Liberty are now at rest next to their grandfather, and although it's been more than 20 years, they are still mourned to this day by those who loved them. With their premature deaths, Faith and Liberty are immortalized as young, innocent girls. It is wild to think that Faith would have been the same age as me. Their futures were stolen by a man who was supposed to care, love, support, and protect the two of them. And as a result, they miss out on everything that life could have been. As I said, John Battaglia took the definition of revenge to a whole new level, a level that is really hard to beat. In fact, this man, he is just pure evil, and it's a good thing that he's gone. Anyway, folks, I think I'm gonna wrap this one up here today. I think I've covered all the bases. Before I go, though, I'd love to know what you think about this one. Do you think that John should have received the death penalty or remained behind bars for the rest of his life? To add to that, it became quite clear that Mary Jane had no idea about John's history even after getting married. So do you think that should be something that is identified in the system or is that too vigilant? Before I go, just a reminder that if you want early access to my videos and additional content, please check out my Patreon. Additionally, check out my social media if you want to follow me and Nero on our adventures. To add to that, please consider subscribing, check out Classified Coffee, and that's pretty much it. Thank you again for watching, folks, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.